right down to that depth, 7,600 feet. So some of them, the primary particles, have this enormous energy. This would not be a primary, this would be a muon, but produced by a primary atomic particle of even higher energy coming in at the top. Here's one. You see it coming along here. Almost certainly due to a neutrino. There's some evidence that it's moving upwards. A neutrino will come through the Earth, struck a nucleus, a very, very rare collision, produce an ordinary particle that we can see which left, left its track. Here's an example. Particle, muon from the atmosphere came down, struck an absorber between these trays of flash tubes and produced a shower of secondary particles. All this work relates to the atomic, the, uh, if you like, nuclear properties of these particles, what they do. And, they and this was a very famous one where you see these two lines, that line and that line, they're converging down here somewhere. A neutrino will have come up, struck a nucleus, produced a pair of particles, which we recorded. Okay, here's a colleague testing tube. Tubes made by a local company, glass tubes, about two meters long, made of silica glass, full of neon, mounted between conducting plates. Particle passes through, you apply high voltage, you get a series of flashes of light. This led on to the so-called spark chamber and the types of chambers that are used at CERN and elsewhere at the present time for determining the tracks of these particles. This is a nice example. In the 1970s, the tubes were used with an enormous magnet here, 300 ton magnet. At that time, ladies and gentlemen, it was the biggest in the world. And I said to my nine-year-old granddaughter, Hillary, who graduated in medicine a few weeks ago from Manchester, Hillary, I said, this magnet is the biggest in the world for cosmic ray research. I said, Grandpa, how many pins could it pick up? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, never mind. And with that, we made all sorts of measurements, and other people elsewhere were doing the same sort of thing, trying to find out about what these cosmic rays do, what secondary particles they produce, and so on. So now we come to the question of where, where do the bad things come from? <laughs> well, the sun is an obvious. Uh, Possibility. This is a picture of the sun taken in X rays, not invisible light. And you see how different it is from the usual, you know, bland picture with perhaps a few dots, black dots on it, use a sunspot. In fact, there would have been some black dots here, 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 here. Because above the sunspots, you get an outwelling of energy, which by some mystery, uh, produces very, very high energy corona. So whereas the surface of the sun is at six, about 6,000 degrees, it produces white light with a peak in the yellow. And that's why our sight has this spectral response. It's just the response to the sun because of evolution. This outer region here, just beyond it, two million degrees. As I say, the mechanism, the heating is not completely, uh, completely clear, not yet. A possible source is this, Eta Carina. See, the difficulty is this. You've got these cosmic ray particles coming in. You can detect their direction. But there's no point in taking a telescope and looking along the direction from which this high energy particle came, looking for a funny star or another galaxy because of the magnetic field, not in the Earth, but the field in the space between the stars. There's a field of 
about three million of the gas, about a million of the earth's field, which uh, deflects the blessed thing. So if you see one coming from there, the odds are it started out over here somewhere. It's been wandering around for 10 million years in the galaxy and then comes into the earth. So it's very hard to find out where the blessed things are coming from. Possibilities, Eta Carina, which is what happened after the star behind here. A lot of this is dust produced by the explosion, a minor explosion of a star, so-called Nova. More important is objects of this type. This is the famous Crab supernova remnant. A star that ran out of fuel and exploded in 1057, seen in daylight, daylight, for about 50 days, recorded mainly in the east. The Brits were into recording things at that time. And that the uh, people in Korea and in Japan noted down the appearance. And that's what it looks like now. So it's exploded, and the parts are moving out at quite a high speed. And you see these wisps here. These are regions of strong magnetic field and it seems that these atomic particles get trapped in these regions and accelerate it faster and faster and faster and they form the bulk of the cosmic radiation. Many studies have been made including our own to show that this is the case. At the very highest energies you would say, hey, the energy is high enough, they'll travel in straight lines because the field won't be strong enough to deflect them. What do you find then? You find almost complete isotropy, the same number, except for a few extra, very highest energies, which seem to be coming from this object, Centaurus A here. And you can see this is a competitive X-ray invisible photograph and it shows a jet of material. Almost certainly a black hole is involved in the centre, generating the energy. How? Quantically. Not yet. So, so what is the future of this subject? I've gone on about the, the history. Let's have a look at what lies in store. Divide it up into various parts. Origin, where are they coming from? One thing I should have mentioned and didn't is the total amount of energy coming in, in cosmic rays, in particles, is about the same as that in starlight. Now starlight, of course, its energy, its radiation is what astronomers study. And they get quite a lot of money for doing that, telescopes and all the rest of it. But on the cosmic ray side, same amount of energy, do we get the same amount of money as the astronomers? We do not. There is no equipartition of cash as there is equipartition of energy. It is a disgrace. <laughs> May change, of course. It's an interesting point. So, we want to confirm that supernova remnants, exploding stars, are responsible. We find that uh, these things can ac accelerate particles up to 1 PeV, which is 10 to the power 15 electron volts, 10 to the 15. The molecules in this room have an energy of about 1 30th of an electron volt. 1 30th, this is 10 to the 15, so that's an enormous temp effective temperature. But the cosmic rays go on a further factor of 5 to 10 to the power 20, and it means that If I were to lift this up by about two feet 
I won't ask for volunteers. Now, if I then drop it, it's very heavy. That would have an energy equal to the energy that a single atomic particle has right at the top end. And we don't know how it gets that energy. It's a bit scandalous, isn't it? The 10 to the power 15 would perhaps be something like that, much smaller, that amount of energy. In one atomic particle, still, it's a lot. So, are they really extra galactic? What are the mechanisms for acceleration? What of work is being done remains to be done. Interactions is that picture I showed before. It may be there are surprises still in store here because the cosmic rays extend to much higher energies than you can achieve in Geneva. It's, uh, the only problem is that the highest energy, you get about one per acre per decade. It's not very high, is it? Whereas at CERN, you get about a million per second or something of that sort. We get on to the origin of life. I'm one of those who is keen on the idea that life, human and other life, was caused initially by lightning. Lightning, there's some work in the 1950s which showed that if you passed a high current through a liquid, water and alcohol, formaldehyde, the sort of liquid that was on the earth half a billion years after it formed, then you get complicated molecules, RNA, amino acids, and so on. The building block, in a sense, the very earliest elements. And I'm keen on this, and we've published some work on this, because it seems that cosmic ray showers have a, have a role in triggering lightning. If you were to go up in a, a, a balloon into a thunderstorm, I don't advise it. If you were, you would find, seriously, that the potential difference, so you, you're an atmospheric electrician, you measure the electric, electrical field, which is about 100 volts per meter in this room. If you measured it, you'd find it's not high enough to cause sparks. Something is triggering it. And cosmic ray showers seem to be the best bet. And if, in the early, early Earth, if you like, in the atmosphere of the early Earth, there were, the solar system were to pass, as it will have done, close to one of these exploding stars as it moved around the galaxy, then you get an excess of lightning and you could indeed get life starting. Just one of a number of possibilities for the origin of life. But notwithstanding that, lightning, certainly contemporary lightning, produces NOx, that is nitrous oxide, NO2, and so on. And this gas, if you like, 20% of the nitrous oxide produced by lightning at the moment. It's poisonous for humans in quantity and good for plants. So our view is that as time has gone on, we've gone through phases where e our evolution has accelerated because there's been very little of this stuff, and other periods when it's moved very, very slowly because there's been a lot of this nitrous oxide. 